Good day, my dear brothers and sisters and friends in Christ Jesus. Once again, I share with you Jude's greeting. <clears throat> Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Today is our fourth class in the series, Keep Yourself in the Love of God, a study of the Epistle of Jude. And today's class will focus on verses 11 to 15 of Jude and has the title Clouds Without Water. So where have we got to so far? We've got to have a feeling for this enthusiastic half-brother of our Lord, Jude, who sees Jesus as his Lord. And he wanted to write a letter about the common salvation, but saw a threat and felt that he had to address it. And so with diligence, he wrote, and his message was this, that there was ungodly folks crept into the ecclesia, teaching that it didn't matter so much how hard we try. And his exhortation for us is we have to contend earnestly. Now, today's class is uh, it focuses again on the ungodly. And it, the, the passages we're going to be looking at um, have some pretty vivid language. And there's a lot about hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is definitely a failing of the ungodly and, and maybe all of us to some degree. We're called to earnestly contend. And, you know, one way of slacking off is to go through the motions. I get kind of amused by Zoom because as far as appearances go, you know, I've got a nice shirt on here and everything, and y'all don't know whether maybe I have uh, you know, green khaki camping pants on that don't, don't match. And, you know, you, you'll never know. But the thing is, God does know. And while this isn't, if I indeed did have green khaki camping shorts on, that wouldn't really matter all that much. But there's so many exhortations in scripture against hypocrisy. You know, servants are called on in Colossians to serve their masters as if they were serving the Lord, not doing eye service as men pleasers. And when you read in, in the Gospels, really Jesus' most scathing words are directed at hypocrisy. Like in Matthew 6, when he talks about those that sound a trumpet before them, or who pray standing apart in the temple saying, oh, I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. John's gospel condemns certain of the chief princes of the people, the rulers of the people, perhaps from the Sanhedrin on the grounds that they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And there's always this danger of us going through the motions of, of, of appearing to be godly when we're not. So as we consider uh, Jude's rather scathing portrayal of the ungodly this morning, let's also look at it as a call to examining ourselves. So verse 11, in very rapid succession, uh, refers to three cases in the Old Testament to illustrate the, uh, the behavior of hypocritical, ungodly folks. And illustrates in each case the dangerous consequences for others. Jude verses 12 and 13 has a whole series of really vivid word pictures that we might be inclined to sort of pass over lightly, but they, they're biblical. And, and one thing I really want to say, um, you know, when we're studying the Bible, if there's, an, if there's a quote from the Old Testament, check out the context, because very often a couple of words quoted is telling us to go back and look at the larger context. We'll see that in particular in, in Hosea chapter 6 in a little bit. So there's some vivid word pictures in verses 12 and 13. 
And then to conclude this section of Jude, there's reference to the prophecy of Enoch, uh, which said that from of old, this sort of behavior has been condemned and judgment will come upon it. So that's where we're going to go. What we're going to do, uh, though, is we're going to start off with verses 12 and 13 and sort of go through them a little bit more quickly and then come back to verse 11. So as I said, our goals are to examine our, our motivation and our priorities and to rededicate ourselves to worshiping in spirit and in truth, real genuine worship not something that just focuses on the way other people see us, but recognizing that God sees. So, Jude, let's read verses 12 and 13. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These ungodly are first described as spots in your feast of charity. Or if you have some of the more modern translations, they may well use the word uh, something like a hidden reef. That's in the American Standard Version, for instance. And the, and the word picture is, you know, imagine yourself on a lake floating along in your canoe, and then you see this little blemish on the water. There's a reef there, and if you hit that, you're in trouble. It's going to poke a hole in your canoe and you'll sink. Um, it's clearly visible to the one who searches the mind and the heart, as Jeremiah says, but it's maybe they're ready to make shipwreck of our faith. So they are hidden reefs in our love feasts. What are the love feasts? The love feasts are most, most likely the, the feast of love, the breaking of bread. And Jude describes them as being there, and the words, the words pasturing, like shepherd does, pasturing themselves. They're feeding themselves rather than feeding the flock of God. I can't help but think of Ezekiel chapter 34, and I, you know, I think it's probably worth us turning it up. It's the uh, prophecy in Ezekiel about the good and evil shepherds. I'm trying to make my fonts bigger for you, just in case your eyes are like mine. So he says in Ezekiel 34, verse 2, <clears throat> Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds flee, feed the flock? Makes you think of you know, it makes you think of some of the rich and successful televangelists who are there to, to line their pockets. And we contrast that with what Paul says in Acts 20 to the uh, Ephesians. He says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed, to pasture the ecclesia of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. And so also in 1 Peter, the elders which are among you, I exhort, Feed the flock of God. So Jesus had said to Peter in John 21, remember that three times the question, do you love me? Well, feed my sheep. It's a very valuable lesson for all of us as shepherds in the ecclesia. And so in particular, we might ask ourselves on a Sunday morning, when we are there at memorial service at the feast of love, 
we're there to be fed, yes, but we're there also to feed others. So have a look around at that brother or sister who is by themselves, the, the, the immigrant perhaps whose English isn't so good, or, or someone who's new to the meeting, you know, put our effort in to pastoring, and not only on a Sunday morning, but all the time. I've left Ezekiel 34 up on the screen because I want to scroll down to the end of the chapter. Such a lovely passage here in verses 23 to 28. I will set up one shepherd over them. And he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, and we know that's a, a title of the Messiah, shall be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make with them a covenant of peace, and will cause the evil beasts to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. They'll no more be a prey to the nations. Beasts of the land won't devour them, but they shall dwell safely and none shall make them afraid. So it's with that hope in mind that we pasture the flock of God. Okay, the next one, back to Jude, verse 12. They are clouds without water. Now, we don't, we sort of can take for granted, at least where I live, we can take water for granted pretty much. You turn on the tap and out comes the water. But it hasn't always been that way, and it still isn't that way all the time. Um, but water really matters, especially in biblical times. You can imagine what it was like after three years of drought in the time of Elijah. And you can imagine what it was like when Elijah sent his servant said, go look, and he comes back, he says, there's a little cloud, a little cloud like a man's hand. It's coming, and Elijah says, tell Ahab, get in your chariot and get going, you're going to get overwhelmed with the rain that's coming. Water really matters. Let's have a look at Hosea chapter 6, where this reference to clouds without water comes. It's in Hosea chapter 6, Verses 1 to 4. I ask you to turn it up with me. Hosea chapter 6. Starts this way. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us. He hath smitten, he'll bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third days he will raise us up and will live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain into the earth. The, 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 the early and the later rains, both of which were crucial for the success of the of crop. But look at the prophet's response in verse 4. O oh, Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O oh, Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew, it goeth away. The historical context of Hosea is one in which the people were willing to go through all the outward motions of worship, but not to sincerely bring forth fruit to God. So if you were a farmer, you would understand this picture. of, Oh, there's the cloud. It's going to rain. It's like that hand in the time of Elijah. But then it dissipates, and all that promise disappears. It would be a bitter disappointment. And it was a bitter disappointment to God as well. Here in Hosea 6, we just turn back to chapter 5. Verse 6, verse 5 for the context, says, The pride of Israel testifies to his faith. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity, and Judah also shall fall with them. They go with their flocks and with their herds to seek the Lord. Look at all these animals they're going to offer. 
They, boy, they must be good people. But they shall not find him, it says in verse 6. He hath withdrawn himself from them. And the reason is given what we've just seen in chapter 6, that their goodness, Isaiah 6, verse 4, was like a morning cloud. Now, come over back again to chapter 6, and notice that verse 4, it says, your goodness is as a morning cloud. The word goodness there is the word chesed, which occurs also in verse 6 in a passage that Jesus quotes re repeatedly. He says, I desired mercy, chesed, the goodness of verse 4, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. So you can come with your flocks and herds, but if you don't come with knowledge of God, you're like a cloud that has the promise of something good, but not the reality. So you see, you know, you see here when we're looking at um, uh, uh, Jude verse 12, and there's this reference to their, them being clouds without water, it has a rich background. And I really exhort us when we're studying the New Testament and we see an allusion to something in the, in the old, we should really go back and check out the context because there's a whole lot more very often. Proverbs says, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. All right, continuing on in Jude 12 and 13. Description of trees whose fruit withers, who are without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Here Jude adds one to his list that has no parallel in 2 Peter 2. Picture it in your mind's eye. A tree, first with fruit, but withered and nasty kind of fruit. Then you, the next time you look at it, there's not even any fruit at all on it. And then the next time you look at it, the tree is dead. In fact, twice dead, plucked up by its roots. Are there any biblical allusions behind that? Well, there's, you know, we're familiar with Jeremiah 24's description of the, the King James says naughty fruit, <laughs> naughty figs, you know, not that they're badly behaved, they just, they don't taste good. They, they're dry and worthless. Um, and these represent the captives from Judah um, in the time of wicked Zedekiah. We might also think of Jesus looking for fruit on the fig tree and finding none, he later cursed it. I wonder if maybe there might be an allusion to the Judaizers who we've seen connections those who were insisting on keeping the, the law, uh, then the phrase twice dead could mean that the ungodly here mentioned were ones who had once been part of the dead body of Jewry, ransomed out of that to life in Christ, but now dead once again. And then there would be a, that would make a good parallel to the passage in 2 Peter where it talks about, uh, you know, it would be better not to have converted and then to revert back to your old way. So they're like these trees, the ungodly. They're like raging waves of the sea, the fifth of these descriptions of the ungodly. Blustering. What do we think of with waves? You know, we think of mankind like the sea that's all stirred up. We think of what it says in Ephesians about uh, like we can be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. This is the ungodly. Finally, they're like wandering stars. Now, interesting thing about the, the wandering stars, we don't, I guess, spend an awful lot of time out staring at the, star, at the sky at night. We've got light pollution and, and, and all that, so we don't see it quite as much. We live in our houses and aren't outdoors quite as much. Um, but if we were watching, we'd see the, the movement of the stars through the sky every night. And over the course of time, we'd see them move, the movement of the constellations. 
occasionally there'd be a wandering star, one that wasn't quite going in the right direction. Of course, that was that was the planets. And in fact, that's the word in in uh, in Greek here, uh, planetes. Um, it might also refer to shooting stars, uh, sort of a brief, brief blaze of glory. But it's interesting that this word is used figuratively in a couple of places in the New Testament about seducing spirits and deceivers and antichrist. So in all of these things, we have very vivid language to portray the ungodly as dangerous. They are the hidden reefs that might sink your canoe. They are full of outward promise, but have no real substance. They are fruitless. The vigor of these words, I think, is made all the more remarkable by Jude's cautioning of us that we, you know, that, that we don't be uh, harsh in our in our, our reckonings. That we that we follow the course of action that, that Michael the archangel did when he said, "The Lord rebuke thee." It can only be that that Jude spoke these words in full confidence that he's being guided by the Spirit of God. Now, there is something unsettling for us in the strength of the words, especially because nowadays tolerance is held up as the chiefest virtue. Tolerance can be a virtue if we're, we're not asked to tolerate things God doesn't. The vigor of Jude's words convinces us of the seriousness of the threats that the ungodly posed. And it, in the examples that we're now going to turn to in the verse leading up, verse 11, we will get some insights into why those threats were so serious, and they had to do with hypocrisy and its evil consequences. So Jude, verse 11. In the context, we... we um, We have the reference to the, to the angels of sin, to Sodom and Gomorrah, the reference to them as filthy dreamers, the good example of Michael the archangel contrasted with their tendency to speak evil of things they don't know. And so carrying on verse 11, Jude says, woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So I want to spend a little time on each of these. We spent some time on Korah the other day, so we won't need to spend as, as much on that. But let's, let's start off with Cain. Let's ask ourselves this question. Why wasn't Cain's offering accepted? Most of the time, I think we say that the problem was with the offering. That the ground had been cursed and that God was dissatisfied with Cain because he offered something from the cursed ground. So in the law of Moses, Robert Roberts writes this. If any man of you would bring an offering to the Lord, ye shall bring thus and so, not anything that might occur to the offerer, but that which is required. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock. God accepted the latter, but not the former. It's probable that Abel's offering was a conformity to revealed requirement, while Cain's would be in accordance with his own idea of what was suitable. If it was by faith that Abel offered unto God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, we have to remember that faith acts upon revealed requirements. So it might have been that there was something wrong with the offering itself. But let's not the mistake, make the mis what I consider a mistake of focusing on the mechanics of the offering alone, because even a proper offering 
offered in the wrong spirit is unacceptable to God. We saw that in, in Hosea with them bringing their flocks and their herds, but God had withdrawn from them. It says in Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. What's wrong with an offering made, if it's the right offering, but it's done in the wrong spirit? Well, because it shows complete risk to this disregard for the true purpose and meaning of sacrifice, making the sacrifice nothing more than the appeasement of an angry God. When God had in fact instituted sacrifice from the beginning, for man, for the purging of conscience. Now, I want you to take special notice of this in Genesis 4, verses 5 to 7. It says, unto Cain and to his offering, God had not respect. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. It had to do with his, what he did. So, Someone might argue that Cain was, you know, well-intentioned but misinformed. But it's not that so much as that fundamentally, Cain was an unfaithful man. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. What was wrong with Cain? The problem with Cain was that he was an evil man. And that's what it says in 1 John chapter 3 when it talks about him, him killing his brother. Why did he kill him? Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. So it wasn't just his offering that was the problem. Proverbs 21, verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind? Now, there's, there's an important lesson in the example of Cain. It appears that Cain wanted to be accepted. He was willing to go through the motions. But there was something wrong, and there was something shallow and hollow in his offering. And so it wasn't accepted. It's the first principle of our approach to God that it must be in sincerity. The de lesson that David learned when he had sinned in the matter of Bathsheba was that there was no sin. Uh, sorry, for such sins, there was no offering that the law prescribed. There was no way he could even go through any outward motions of repentance when the prophet convicted him and said, you're the man. The proper spirit is what he illustrated in Psalm 51. When he pours himself out, he says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Behold. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. This is an important first principle, and a uniquely lovely feature of Christadelphian understanding is that sacrifice is not for the satisfaction of God, but instituted by God for man. So there's the lesson of Cain. The error of Balaam. 
They've gone in the way of Cain. They've ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward. How about you open your Bible over to Numbers chapter 22? So the children of Israel are in their travels. And they're approaching the land. It says in verse 3 that Moab was very afraid of the children of Israel coming through. And they were distressed. So they said, well, we better do something. So they send messengers to Balaam, a, a man of God, a man whose words counted. And they say in verse 6, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. For they're too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou bless is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the reward. And here's the important this was what Balaam had his eye on the reward of divination in their hand. And they came into Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. So Balaam greets this company, and, and he, he, says, he says, well, let's, uh, let's look at what God has to say, and I'll, I'll give you an answer in the morning. Um, but, and he says, I can't go beyond the word of the Lord my God. And so, so far, so good. He's doing pretty good. Um, then the next morning, he says, he, the, he, he, well, look, look at verse 18. Balaam answered and said to the servants of, of Balak, if Balaam, Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye here also this night, another night, that I may know whether the Lord will say any more unto me. It's kind of hoping that maybe God will change his mind and, and let him fill himself up with riches. Verse 20. God came to Balaam at night and said, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. In verse 21, Balaam rose up in the morning, and saddled his ass, and went with the princes of Moab. It says in verse 22 that God's anger was kindled because he went. Why should God be angry? I believe it's because it says, if the men are come. Go with him. We can see in Balaam's getting up early, his early rising, his enthusiasm for the opportunity to get his hands on some of this loot. Jude says he ran greedily, seeking reward. Jude and 2 Peter bring our attention to an aspect of the character of Balaam that we might miss in reading the account in Numbers 22, that he was motivated by greed. I've often wondered at Balaam's response to his donkey. It says in 2 Peter 2, verse 16, he was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And Balaam should answer, Shows he wasn't really in control of himself, doesn't it? He says, I wish I had my sword. Oh, I show you, donkey. Then maybe there is some awareness of the unworthiness of his mission. And so Jude says in verse 11, woe to them. Is that just a rhetorical flourish? I don't think so. There's something pitiful in the case of Cain wanting to be expected, willing to go through the outward motions, but unable to muster the proper spirit. And so too in the case of Balaam, there's something pitiful in the way he ran greedily after the reward offered, knowing what was right, but not having the integrity to follow through. And then we see later on in the case of Balaam that he, 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 he gave the suggestion about how to really bring Israel down, and that led to Baal Peor. So we apply these lessons to ourselves. We think about priorities. We want to put God's will first. And there's 
inevitably going to be a conflict in us if we don't acknowledge God's will first. Because if we don't put God's will first, we'll compromise. It's a very personal matter. Nobody can do it for us, nor can we do it for another person. You wonder what Balaam was thinking and how he rationalized. So as with Cain, so with Balaam, initial weakness gave rise to bitter, terrible mistreatment of the faithful and became a thing to no longer be pitied. For Balaam, when he couldn't utter the curses his patrons sought, three times he attempted to curse and three times blessings came out. So privately, we find out later on, he gave the Moabite lords the key to vanquishing Israel, to tempt them into sexual immorality. And it's an appropriate reference given Jude's um, contention against some that would turn the grace of God into licenses. And so with Balaam, as with Cain, self-centeredness turned to evil being brought on, his, on the brethren. Okay, the third example in verse 11 is the gainsaying of Korah, about which we've had something to say the other day in the context of the angels that sinned. It wound up bringing great harm on the brethren. When God's judgments came, a number of them were killed. The children of Israel wound up murmuring against Moses and Aaron, saying, you killed the people of the Lord. And God says, get up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And he sends a plague, and 14,700 died because of this. So sometimes, with the ungodly, their selfishness, its evil consequences, don't just fall on them, but on those they influenced. And so we put in contrast to this, the proper spirit of Philippians 2, that's self-effacing, that says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of the other. And so in verses 11 through 13 of, of Jude, we've had the condemnation of hypocritical, self-serving, superficial worship. And Jude concludes this section with reference to a prophecy of Enoch. Now you'll notice that in verse 4, Jude says that these ungodly were before of old times ordained to this condemnation. And now he shows just how far back this ordination to this condemnation occurred. It goes all the way back to the time of Enoch. So we read in verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, just in case there's any confusion about who I'm talking about here, prophesied of these saying, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. And this is a bit of a difficult passage um, for a number of reasons. First, first of all, there's, there's no words of Enoch recorded in scripture. In fact, the entire account of Enoch's life is found in, in, in four verses in Genesis chapter 5. I'll read them for you. Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. That's the complete account. And the only other scriptural commentary we have on the life of Enoch is in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter about the faithful. 
There in verse five, it says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So we were even left in a bit of a, a quandary, but what's it mean that God translated him? Um, it, it's, it, it's the phrase, it's the word that's used of, of uh, the transfer of Joseph's bones that he was, he was taken away. It's used figuratively of the Levitical priesthood in, in Hebrews 7. Um, but they, they, a lot of questions come with our mind. But this much is clear. He walked with God. It's a marvelous phrase. It's only used of Enoch and Noah. Of others, we read that they walked before God. For example, Abraham and Isaac. But Enoch, that he walked with God. I'm reminded of Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, where Adam and his wife heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves and, and in fact it's interesting that in genesis the phrase that god took him that god took him of of enoch it's remarkable i, I don't know how many times i've read this without noticing it but it's the same as is used in genesis 2 verse 5 when it says the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it in fact, that's the only other time it, the Old Testament speaks about God taking a man. So what, what became of Enoch, we don't know. It's a tantalizing account to the point of encouraging speculations of all sorts. But this much we can be sure of. He was an outstanding man in his fellowship with God. He was taken before the birth of Noah, but likely in the time when wickedness was beginning to grieve God's heart. Enoch was the seventh from Adam in the, in the line of Seth, and Lamech, the first polygamist, was the seventh in the line of Cain. We can think of the decay that started at that point in time in, in, in man's behavior. We could imagine Enoch speaking words like these recorded in Jude. Like many scriptural prophecies, words that would have relevance at more than one particular instance. Then the prophecy of Enoch would be the perfect illustration of what Jude had said in verse 4, that the condemnation of such men had been of old ordained. Now, there's a great word that you can add to your vocabulary um, if you don't already have it. It's hysteresis, um, sort of like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Because if you say it loud enough, you always sound precocious. Hysteresis is a subsequent narration of prior events. Brother Edward Whitaker has, in his book for the study and defense of the Holy Scriptures, he calls it the principle of added revelation. And, there, and there's lots of examples, some of which might be familiar to you. Like, for instance, in James 5, where it says that Elijah prayed fervently that it might not rain. And then that it was three and a half years that it didn't rain. Both of those are details that are not given. Another one in, 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 in the original. Another one in, in Hebrews 12 is that, um, that the events at Sinai were so awe-inspiring that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So I think the simplest explanation of this is that it's a filling in of, of facts that we didn't know otherwise. A little difficulty comes because there's a, an apocryphal book of Enoch that uses very similar language. And I just display that quickly on the screen there. Um, I'm inclined to dismiss this. At, uh, certainly it's, it's an unreliable book and it's kind of hard to imagine that Enoch, uh, I'm sorry, that Jude would be quoting something that wasn't inspired. Um, some say, well, you know, Paul quoted Epimenides the Cretan on at least two occasions. 
And, uh, but I, I, I think the explanation of a subsequent narration of, of telling us about it after the fact is a much better explanation. But the purpose of the citation is clear. It's to say that from the very beginning, superficiality of worship has been condemned. Jude said it, that of old, this sort of thing has been ordained to, to condemnation. And you know, this sort of hypocritical, ungodly worship, and remember we, at the beginning of the, of the series, we, we mentioned that the word ungodly means without worship, like it's acebus rather than eusebus. Eusebus is good worship, eusebia, good worship. Cornelius, a devout man, eusebus. These ungodly are acebus, they're without worship. And those whose worship is only in the externalities are really in reality without worship in God's eyes. And so Jude's quote of Enoch confirms what Paul says, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Those who would walk with God must do so in spirit and in truth. So why quote Enoch? It's to say that superficiality of worship has never been acceptable to God, that ungodliness inevitably betrays itself. And this all being the case, let us beloved, as Jude says in verses 20 and 21, build ourselves up in our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping ourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. The worst threat to the way of faithfulness is that which masquerades as the real thing, but deals only in externalities. What an awful thing to have said about you, that you were a cloud without water. On the other hand, look at the positive alternative. Because if our worship is sincere, if it's Eusebus, we will be like the early and the latter rain, we'll be a blessing to our brethren. So let's commit ourselves once again, brothers and sisters and friends, to earnestly contending, giving our best in service to our Lord. Can we close with prayer? Father in heaven, we know that you see our hearts, that you don't see as men see. And so being known that way, it is wonderful. And we pray that you will search us and know our hearts, know our ways, and see if there be any wicked way in us and purge it from us. We pray for your blessing that we may be your servants and that we may be a blessing. That we may honor your name. Help us to contend earnestly for the way of faithfulness. In Jesus we pray. Amen.